Praise God. I'm so delighted to have you joining us again. Thank you for joining us online as well. Thanks for the kids for being in the service. Parents, thank you for your patience and working with us uh, this particular Sunday. But we do appreciate your pray patience and, and uh, as we look at God's Word here this morning. Now, I remember back, uh, boy, I think in the 80s when I was in Bible school in Minneapolis, Minnesota, I had a part-time job. I was a shuttle bus driver between two hospitals, there were two major hospitals, and I would shuttle doctors and nurses and admin and all kinds of people back and forth in between these hospitals. I love the job because I love people, and I love to be around people. But the odd thing was is all these doctors and nurses, they didn't really want to talk to you. <laughs> they, now, this is before cell phones. This is before devices. This is when the good old uh, daytimers were in vogue. And it was you did your schedule on a piece of paper and... Uh, and they had their big attaches filled with books and journals and their legal pads and everything. So nobody really wanted to talk with you except this one young lady who was a, a ma- inner campus male delivery person. Her name was Nancy, Nancy Wise, a sweet uh, young lady. Uh, she was special needs, and so she would hobble her way to the, the van when I'd pull up to the hospital and I always just felt so compelled to treat her like a queen. And so I'd get out of my car. I wouldn't do this for the doctors and nurses, but for Nancy Wise, I would do it. And I would get out open to the door for her. She'd get in and um, we'd begin our conversation until we got to the, the other hospital. Just a short ride. But it was always just simple conversation about the weather. And, of course, she had cats and all kinds of things that we got to talk uh, with each other. But I remember the feeling that I had each and every time I interacted with her, I just felt like I was in my sweet spot. It was so fulfilling for me to just show her value. I don't know. I don't know. If maybe there was other people that really poured that kind of into her. I don't know. But I, when it was my few minutes that I had, I wanted her to feel like a queen, like she was important, like she was valuable. And it just, I, I felt so good. And I, I remember after that job was over, I, I thought to myself, if I could do that for the rest of my life, I would be so fulfilled and satisfied being able to, to help people see uh, what God sees in them, the value that, that he sees in them. Now, there's other times in my life when I haven't been in my sweet spot, like in chemistry class. I hated chemistry. Sorry if you are a big fan. I just, all the symbols, I thought, what purpose will this serve in my life in the future? I don't like chemistry. I don't want to learn those symbols. I don't care about those symbols. So I didn't care my way to a C minus. I barely passed the class. Uh, It wasn't my sweet spot. Maybe you're like me. You have areas in your life where you're in your sweet spot, other areas where you just feel like you're a fish out of water. It's over your head. You're out on a limb. Maybe you haven't been trained. Maybe you just, you you know, uh, you're a little out of balance, out of your element. Uh, You know, we've all had certain situations like that. Maybe, Maybe you do know what your sweet spot is, but you're not there yet. Because that position at work hasn't opened up yet. Maybe you've been promised it. Maybe you've been kind of setting your sights for it, but it hasn't happened yet. The timing maybe hasn't been right. Maybe you're here today and you really don't know what your sweet spot is. Maybe you're still trying to discover that. Maybe you had a few swings and misses and you're kind of confused, like, I don't even know. Wouldn't it be terrible to go through life not at least having a better idea of what your divine assignment, where your, your spiritual sweet spot is? I want us to go to a text in the Bible, the book of Ephesians, where the church was kind of in that position after Christ had already done his thing and he was raised from the dead, he appeared to many people, and then he went back up to heaven. Before he did that, he passed the baton to uh, his disciples and and. Uh, said, listen, I I got a big job for you. I want you to go throughout the whole world, but don't go yet. Remember, we talked about this a couple weeks ago. I want you to wait till you're filled with my power. And they did. They waited for 10 days. They got filled with the power of the Holy Spirit, and then they became bold witnesses. And here we are, 2,000 years later, we're in a church. We're worshiping Jesus. That message should have never made it out of the the Middle East first century, but God had a way of... Uh, letting his church, helping his early church get in that coracle and uh, 
let, hoist the sail and let the wind of the Spirit take them because the wind of the Spirit just didn't stay in Jerusalem. It didn't just stay among the Jewish people. The wind of the Spirit blew to the Gentiles. And it, it, it came through all kinds of Jesus' early followers. But what happened in the early church, and you, you can read a lot of the story in the book of Acts, is there tended to be times when there was some mission drift when the church was maybe getting a little bit off mission, and so God would send particular people to the church to help bring correction, to help guide them, and the Apostle Paul was one of those people. And he writes a, a, a letter to the churches in Ephesians. Now, Ephesus was a, a major city, a pagan city, very anti-Christ, you know, counter-Christian culture, and Paul actually had established this church uh, a number of years ago before he writes this letter. And that's what Paul would do. He, he, was a, he was an apostle, and so he would go into new territory. He would gather people. He'd preach the gospel. And all of a sudden, there'd be a little congregation beginning to form as people got saved. Then he would appoint and anoint uh, an elder or a pastor or an overseer over that congregation. And then he'd move on. He'd go to the next place where he'd do the same thing over and over. And this particular set of churches in Ephesus must have been kind of getting fragmented. Maybe there was a little bit of lack of unity. Maybe they didn't quite understand uh, how to function in unity or properly as a church. So Paul writes this letter back to these group of churches, and that's what we have is the book of Ephesians. And Paul wrote this while he was in a Roman prison. So he wrote this letter. And if you look at the whole book of Ephesians, you'll see some themes coming through. It's, uh, Paul is really trying to help the church stay unified. He, he must have sensed there was just some fragmentation. They're facing some issues, definitely facing persecution. So he was writing back to them to hold it together, and he was trying to instruct them on how the church best functions. So he writes this letter, and we're going to start in chapter 4. Uh, we're going to go through a bunch of verses here this morning, and then I'm going to make some observations, and then we'll be out of here today, all right? So here we go. Let's pick it up from verse 1, chapter 4. Therefore, this is Paul, I, a prisoner, again, he's writing from a Roman prison. He's in prison for serving the Lord. I beg you to lead a life worthy of your calling. So there's already, I want you to understand, there's this idea that uh, Paul doesn't look at his role as an apostle, as a preacher, as us and them. He's saying, we're not going to talk about my calling. Uh, I mean, I've told my story. I started this church a couple years ago. I spent two years with you helping to build this thing, but this isn't about me. This is about your calling. And so I want you to know even here this morning that you have a calling. All of us have a calling, and that's going to come into focus here this morning. For you have been called by God. And here's some general helps that he's given to the church. He's saying, I want you to always be humble and be gentle, be patient with each other, making allowance for each other's faults. Isn't that a good message for today? How we need that, don't we? Not only in church, but in our families, in our culture, making allowances for each other's faults because of your love. Make every effort. Here again, he's, he's appealing to that need for unity. Make every effort to keep yourselves united in the Spirit, binding yourself together with peace. Now he goes on to this whole theme of oneness. Again, kind of the whole idea of unity and oneness. For there's one body and one spirit, just as you have been called to one glorious hope for the future. In other words, we have one mission. Um, I'm not sure exactly what's happening in your world right now, but maybe through the spirit, God has prompted me to write you this letter to help you to hold it together. Hold it together. I'm in prison myself. I've been persecuted myself. But I, I want this message to ring true, to hold it together. And so he says, there's one Lord, one faith, one baptism, and one God and Father of all. So there's this theme of oneness. And he says God is over all, he's in all, and living through all. However, now he kind of turns it back to them. He has given each one of you a special gift. Now, you see my gifts on display as, as the Apostle Paul, 
But you know what? He's given you a special gift. And I want you to already open your heart and mind up to the fact that you have a special gift, a divine gift. You have natural gifts, natural talents. There's a difference between what your natural inclination is and then maybe what a spiritual gift is. And we're not going to get into that too deep here this time, but we'll, we'll look at that later on. But you do have a special gift through the generosity of Christ. And so jump down to verse 11 just for the sake of time. Now he's talking about the gifts. And he said, these are the gifts that Christ gave to the church. He gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, and the pastors and teachers. Five different gifts, five different roles. Uh, some people call them offices, but we don't want to get into really the, the, the title aspect uh, this morning. But there's five different gifts, there's five different functions, and there's a reason why he gave five, because it'll help him to do this. It's their responsibility to equip the people to do the work of the ministry. It's not the responsibility of the apostles, the prophets, the pastors, teachers, and evangelists to do the ministry. It's their responsibility to equip the people, the congregation, to do the work of the ministry. That's why you need to know what your gift is. You need to know where your spiritual sweet spot is so that we can fulfill, you know, and function as the church is supposed to. And we're doing this to build up the church, the body of Christ. And this will continue. This will continue. This isn't a one-time thing just for the apostles. Once the apostles died out, all these things went away. There's no proof in Scripture of that. This will continue until we all come to such unity in our faith, knowledge of God's Son, that we will be mature in the Lord, measuring up to the full and complete standard of Christ. Wow, will we ever get there? <laughs> measuring up to the complete standard the full and complete standard of Christ. That's why these works, the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, that's why it continues because we're not there yet. There's a lot of work that still the church needs today and, and roles that still need to be played out in the church. Then we'll no longer be immature like children. We won't be tossed and blown away by every wind of new teaching. We'll not be influenced when people try to trick us with lies so clever that they sound like the truth. Instead, we will speak the truth in love, growing in every way more and more like Christ. Again, that's the goal, who is the head of his church, uh, his body, the church. See, he makes the whole body fit together perfectly. Whew. As each part does its own special work. It helps the other parts grow so that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. So Paul sends this word of instruction, this encouragement to the Ephesians church. But what I want to focus on for a few more moments here this morning, and really it's going to be our text for the next several weeks as we look at all these roles of apostles and prophets and evangelists and pastors and teachers. Um, now, no doubt you may be familiar with some of those terms. Uh, you know, pastor, we're pretty familiar with maybe what a pastor does. Maybe you've heard of uh, evangelists. We've had evangelists at our church. Um, you know, maybe the uh, other things are not so much, like apostles and prophets. What in the world is that? Well, I, I want to make some observations about this. You see, the thing is that Jesus is the one who gave these gifts, these roles to the church. This isn't some denomination that said, you know, Pastor Mike, I know you planted that church, you know, 2006. You know, I think you need to have some evangelists come in now and then. I think you should, you know, you, know, you need to, ha you know, whatever. This isn't a man's idea, denomination's idea. This is God's idea. Jesus gave us all five gifts. Now, don't you think if Jesus gave us those five gifts, those five roles, we ought to pay attention. We ought to be able to know what those roles are? I mean, if I give you a gift, I'm sure you'd be grateful and, you know, wow, thanks, Pastor Mike, that's awesome. But if I came to visit you five months later and I was looking for my gift, I won't do that. You know, maybe you uh, just put it on a shelf or maybe you regifted it. You know, you know, again, I, I won't check up on you on that. But, you know, a big deal if I give you a gift. But if Jesus gives the church his body 
All five gifts, don't you think they're important for us to understand? Now, we, they may not be clearly defined. I mean, growing up in the, in the church, basically, I knew the pastor role, but I, I didn't know what an apostle was, a prophet, um, you know, all these other things. I didn't know that. Um, so I really think, uh, you know, we, we need to understand all of them are important, and they're equal. Just because, in fact, look at the list. Just because apostles are listed first doesn't mean they're more important than teachers. I think there's a strategic order, but it's not order of importance. Because really, that's the strategic part. Is it, That's kind of how it works. I, off, I kind of functioned as an apostle when I started, God helped us start this church in Dillsburg. We came into new territory. I'm not from Dillsburg. God planted us here, and we felt the call and need to start a church, another Assembly of God church. Our district wanted another church here. And so apostolically, you know, into new territory, began to set up a church. And, and that's how it would function even in the New Testament. Even prophets were involved with help guiding and directing where and when. Then, you know, the evangelist comes in and stirs it up and, and uh, is good at winning people to the Lord. And all of a sudden now a congregation of believers is being formed. And then what do you do? You, you put a pastor, an elder, an overseer in charge of that congregation, and then you need the teachers to come in and disciple. People can just break down truth easily, and all of a sudden now we're making disciples. So there's a great strategic order here, but it's not the order of importance. All five are important, and all five are equal. But not only that, there's a myth, there, it, the Bible says in verse 13, we looked at it, that this will continue. Some people believe that all the gifts, the supernatural stuff, the, the gifts of the Spirit, the roles of apostles, all that ceased when the last apostle died. It's called cessationism, and that's, that's not the case. There's no biblical proof. In fact, here's proof here in this very context of this verse that said this will continue. The function of these gifts that I just talked about, they will continue until all this has happened. Have we reached the complete standard of Christ yet? No. Like I said, we got a long way to go. So that's why we still need all these gifts in operation. And what is, oh, I think I might have skipped a slide. Let's go, no, okay. Okay, here's a major misconception that we have. That ministry is for paid clergy. Well, you know, we pay you, Pastor Mike. We pay you, Pastor Luke. It's, the ministry is just for paid clergy. Well, that's, that. That's not what the text says. It says that our responsibility is to equip the people to do his work and to build up the church because there's only so much that we can do and, and that, you know, that, that, that we can reach. And so that's where we have to be involved. We have to be, understand what our gift is and, and how, to be, how to use that. Um, so... Not everyone is called to oversee these gifts because he says these are the gifts and it's their responsibility to teach and train others. So not everybody's going to oversee. Not everybody's going to fulfill the role of a full-time pastor or some of these other areas. But everyone, you and me, together, we're to cooperate with and to function in the gifts of those areas as as we follow the leadership and as, as we find out what our spiritual sweet spot is. Now, what I uh, want to talk about for a few moments is how I really think, and this is kind of a picture that the Lord gave to me this week in, in prayer, is that the church that I've known, not, not just celebration, but the church that I have known has really, if you're, if you're taking this biblical passage we're looking at for the next few, we're out of balance we're out of balance. And it's kind of like this. And in fact, thanks, Virgil, for bringing in your wagon wheel. Sorry, you can't use your wagon for the next couple of weeks. I got this for an illustration. But I mean, this is, a, this is like this could carry a load, right? I mean, it's a steel wagon wheel. It's legit. Um, but could you imagine if it only had one spoke? You wouldn't get too very far without it being out of balance, lopsided. Now, I mean, it's a steel frame, so it, it probably would go for a while, but it wouldn't take long before it would be out of balance, lopsided, and it'd be a pretty rough ride. And I really believe that this is kind of the picture of the modern-day church. We're, we're a little out of balance. 
Um, you know, we're a one-role ministry instead of a five-role ministry, a one-fold ministry rather than a five-fold ministry. Because, hey, you're familiar with a pastor, but could you define what an apostle is, a prophet? And again, all five gifts Jesus gave to the church to strengthen the church. And how do we most of the time operate? Is with one role being filled, the pastor role. I mean, how effective would this be if it just had one spoke in it? Not very effective. It's not going to be able to carry the weight and load unless it has all the spokes in play. And unfortunately, we've been a little out of balance. Now, we know the pastor role. Uh, the pastor has become kind of the catch-all ministry. Uh, fulfills all the functions, you know, in the church. That's what, that's what the pastor is supposed to do. And so, you know, the pastor is a leadership expert. You know, got to be a leadership expert. The pastor really needs to be an expert Bible teacher to be able to exegete out of the Greek and Hebrew and expound on the biblical truths, rightly divide the word of truth. And yes, that's a, that's a responsibility, but we're also a caretaker. We're a counselor. We're there for every family crisis and every marriage crisis. We're making, you know, visiting everybody in the hospital and kind of the caretaker. That's uh, one of the roles pastors play. But not only that, we, you know, the, we're the community evangelist. We're always sharing our faith. We're always winning people to Christ. But not only that, um, we're kind of prophetic too because, you know, we got to kind of assess the, the moral climate in our culture and, you know, point out where we you don't know, get on a slippery slope, uh, you know, buying into this thought and, and you know, the decline of culture, uh, you know, we're to, to assess, you know, the season of our, our life that we live in. But not only that, now we're a political analyst, <laughs> okay? We're like, all right, Pastor Mike, where do you stand? Who are you voting for? You know, where do you line up politically? And so, boy, a lot of pressure lately has been on, you know, where do you stand? Pastor Mike, I wish you'd take a stand. I've heard people say that. And I, I have to answer you with, what, your stand? Any stand or your stand? That's what people want. They want you to be on their stand. How can I be on 400 people's stand, right? Okay, so now we have to be political analysts. And uh, now I've got to be a chief executive officer, chief financial officer as, as I, I lead the board. Um, you know, <laughs> wow, look at that. And then even a toilet bowl cleaner if, it, if, if the need arises. So you got one spoke doing all these things. Is it any wonder that 1,500 ministers leave the ministry every month? Did you know that? 1,500 trying to bear the load of all these things. This is an unrealistic expectation, unrealistic assumption, and an unbiblical job description. The pastor, one spoke, is not meant to carry that entire load. And so you get a church that's out of balance. And you, you get a lot of people leaving the ministry because, and especially with COVID, I mean, that, that was like a final nail for, for a lot of people. Um, now, I'm not saying this to bring pity on me. I signed up for this. I'm called to this. I wake up every day with 100% focus and energy trying to have the best attitude every day, but not always. So I, I'm, I'm not looking for pity. I'm just, I'm just saying I think we've been out of balance. And often we don't even understand what these other roles are. And so these five that Jesus gave are meant to strengthen the church, the whole church, not just burn out a few. And again, some of these like, you know, prophet and apostle, they can be divisive. In a church, they can, they can be um, confusing, and there'll be people that, I don't know about all that, Pastor Mike, I think I'm just going to settle for the safe church down the street, you know, or they're not screaming and yelling you, you know, trying to scare the hell out of you to get you to heaven, or, or pushing you over, or laying hands on you. I just want the safe church down the street, and, and so then, you know, church growth worldwide isn't keeping up with worldwide population. Church is generally in decline. And so maybe it's because we've just been relying on a spoke or two. 
and we're out of balance, and we haven't been as effective. So for the last few minutes, I want to take a brief look at all five of these. Don't worry. We're going to move along here, okay? Um, and let's look at the apostle. The apostle simply means sent one, sent away on a mission. I think mis missionaries, and not just I think that, it's, it's pretty much accepted in theological realms, that missionaries generally could be considered apostles because they, they go, they take new territory, they, uh, they act, uh, authorize, act on behalf of the sender, and they go into new territory, pushing back darkness. That's why I said last week with our missionary Jesse Comrie here, I really think he's a modern-day apostle. He's going into areas where he's pushing back darkness. Nobody's been there before. He's bringing the gospel. He's planting churches. And, and so... That's generally what an apostle is. Now, what I don't want you to do here today is I don't want you to think, walk away from here and say, if you identify with one of these areas, like, I'm an apostle. Pastor Mike said, I'm a prophet. We're not into titles. If you're thinking about a title, you're going to get off on the wrong track. We're going to talk enough about these in the next few weeks where you're going to get an understanding that this isn't about title, position, getting hired into church as the prophet. It goes, to, it goes to our head. Even pastors, I know because I am one, have a hard time handling the power and position. I can get prideful. I can get stubborn. I can get narrow-minded. It can go to my head too. So we're not into titles. We're not going to all of a sudden three weeks from hire a prophet on staff. Okay. <laughs> You know, I don't really know where we're going. We're in a coracle, all right? We're in that coracle. We're not in the wind. No, don't, don't worry about that. But um, again, this is, this is so much to cover in 30 minutes. So you're going to have to give me some grace here with trying to break this down the next few weeks. But apostle. So what I want you to do, though, this is filled with opportunity. This is filled with possibilities as to where you kind of lean, maybe where your sweet spot is. Because an apostle, man, the church this, this needs to be alive and well. The church needs to be so apostolic, equipping people, training people, sending people to go beyond where the church, where we have gone before. I mean, blazing new territory in school hallways. How about, how about an apostle mindset in our kids, in our students that are going to go into their hallways or that we're going to go get on the school board. We're going to be in the booster club. We're going to be in national government, local government. We can't shrink back. We got to step up and be apostolic as a church and we got to take new territory regardless of, of racial background, regardless of, of gender orientation. I know a church in, in Florida, uh, there was a lady that came out of uh, the strip clubs. She got saved. And in time, as she got discipled, and uh, she went back, she asked the pastor, I, I, I got a heart for these girls. I know some of these girls. I want to go in and try to help them. And the pastor's like, you go for it. We don't have a discipleship program with strip clubs, but hey, you know, <laughs> You, you want to be an apostle to the, let's, let's go for it. So sure enough, she got some other ladies together, not men, that's not wise, ladies together, and they went in and they began rescuing these girls. I've been involved in a ministry called Wipe Every Tear where, into the Philippines where they go into the brothels. Connie and I, with our daughter Madison, went into the brothels to rescue some young ladies out of the sex trade and give them education, give them a safe place. So we need to be more apostolic than ever before. So maybe there's some of you, you're like, you're like a change agent. You're like an entrepreneur. There's ideas always, you know, coming through you. You're not, you're not, you don't like the status quo. You just, you want to get in and you want to change and you're a creative, you're a, a what if kind of person. You're an innovator, you're a networker, you're a mobilizer, you're a risk taker. Can you imagine a church not having the apostolic gift flowing freely? Maybe that's why we're losing our influence in this culture. We need the apostolic mindset today. And every individual, every person should have that mindset because Jesus is the one who said, listen, as the Father has sent me, so I send you. Sent ones, apostles, sent ones. And uh, so that's, that's apostle. Let's move on to prophet here. Prophet, okay, is basically a seer of visions. Uh, 
dreams uh, from God. And what a prophet typically does, boldly proclaims God's message. Oftentimes a pastor will fill that role when God lays something on his heart to preach or speak prophetically because there's maybe a warning of us going down a certain, heading in a certain direction that, that there's a warning. But prophets call people back to repentance. They're kind of sometimes black and white people. They don't like compromise. Uh, you know, they, they, they don't like to get in. They don't like to back down, which is a great strength, but it can be your greatest weakness too, not to be able to have some flexibility. But um, they, they're restorative, they're affirming, they're encouraging, and sometimes they have spiritual insight into the future. Most of the time, prophets are not uh, foretellers, like telling the future, they're more foretellers. They're taking revealed truth and, and, and the Holy Spirit's inspiration, and they're forth telling the truth, not as much telling the future. The ones who tell, try to tell the future and prophesy, they're the ones that get the press. They get the attention, but they're not always a true prophet, okay? But some of you have that in, in you, just that, that ability to, you know, call it as you see it, and uh, there's just that firmness. You're not, you got some uh, backbone, you got some spine. That's the role of a prophet. Now, let's go to evangelists. Evangelists, that word re means reporter of the good news, distributor of the good news. And that's a person who's really good at bringing people to Jesus. You know, you may be like, yeah, I, I, I like to talk to, I like to share my faith with people. It kind of comes easy for you. You love outreaches. When our church does an outreach, you're right there. You know why? Because you realize there's going to be non-believers there. And that kind of turns you on. Some of us, it might like, oh, I'm afraid. I don't know what to say. Other, you're like, yes. You're, you're just, you're all into that because you love to share your testimony. You could be in a cafe. You could be in a busy airport. And within minutes, you know the names of everybody sitting around you. And you're already, they're already telling you their life story. Other people would walk by somebody and they say, man, there's no hope for them. Not you. You're like, oh, there's always hope. Come on, you can make a change. And, and don't you know that that needs to be alive and well in the church, that evangelistic spirit by all of us? You just, you get turned on when you get an opportunity to, to, to share your faith with somebody. That's the evangelist. D.L. Moody was one of the greatest evangelists in church history. And he didn't even have a very high education. He struggled with the English language. And he said this, I know other people who can preach better than I can, but it's just that when I speak, God uses me. See, he was gifted. He was anointed as an evangelist. Um, so all of us are to share our faith. All of us are to be like evangelists when we uh, sharing our faith. But for some, it just seems to come easier. So you may be bent towards that that direction. How about pastor? Oh, I went too fast. Go back to pastor. All right. Um, that word means protector. It means shepherd. And, and that person's good at leading and caring for believers. That's a person who's going to find themselves maybe in Celebrate Life Ministries, our lay counseling program where you love to come alongside people. You love to encourage them. You're just good one-on-one -on -one with people or you're good. You're kind of a gatherer. And uh, when people are around you, they get so encouraged that they feel like they can go out and conquer their world because they interacted with you. We, this needs to be alive and well in this church, that pastoral spirit, that pastoral attitude where we, we stop and we take our eyes off ourselves and we're, we're gatherers. We're, we're people who want to care and protect and, and feed the flock. That needs to be alive and well in our church, maybe C group leaders, you have a desire to lead a C group. That, that may be part of your tendency or, or gifting there. How about teacher? Teacher, that word means you're, you're an explainer of truth. And not really, you're not a revealer of truth. You're explaining the truth that's already revealed. You can take difficult concepts, heady kind of things, and break it down to where after people are sit with you on a one-on-one -on -one, or maybe in a class that you teach, they're like, oh, I finally get it. Oh, that was so awesome. I, I get it now. You just have a way about breaking complicated things down to wh where they're, they're easy to understand. You just, you have that teacher ability 
within you. And, you know, you're going to find your greatest environment maybe in a C group, a small group, or maybe in the classroom center. Maybe it's one-on-one. Or maybe you don't have to, you're the kind of person, you don't have to wait for somebody to tap you on the shoulder and say, hey, would you teach this class? You're like, I'm a YouTuber, man. I got information. I want to get it out there. You're on social media. You know, you're, you're just going for it because you have it in you and you just can't contain it. And you want to help people to understand that they're real disciple makers. Um, so, can't you see that all five, all five of these are desperately needed in the church for us to be in balance and for us to be effective and to us be able to carry the load of culture today and to lead them in the right direction. All five. Now, you might be here to say, well, Pastor Mike, wow, that's a lot in 30 minutes. I don't know what I think about prophets and apostles and evangelists. I'm just trying to get through my marriage. <laughs> I'm just, you know, I've been being bullied online. I don't know. I'm about ready to lose my mind. I, you know, I'm facing this battle. I'm facing, I, I, that sounds good for you clergy type. That sounds good for your church as an organization. I, yeah, I get the wheel thing, but I, I just, how does that help me right now? Well, you might be undervaluating, undervaluing and underestimating this next statement. Look it up here. Finding and functioning in your divine purpose, your divine assignment that we've been talking about, will lead you to the fulfillment and satisfaction that you've been longing for. Would you just sit on that for a moment? Discovering what you are on the earth for. Not for me. I could say, hey, I, I love you. You're awesome. This, I, you know, I can see you doing this. That's just words. But your creator God to be able to impart to you and help you to understand what your divine assignment and purpose, that will give you more fulfillment, more satisfaction than breaking the company's sales record that month or that quarter. It'll give you more fulfillment than finishing in the top 5% of your graduating class or or getting that scholarship or having enough to retire on. That right there. Don't underestimate. Fine. Why not start now? Why wait? And why not start early? Students and young adults here, don't wait another 10, 20 years before you end up, you know, in midlife and still, I don't know, you know I have had this job and I just, I, it's a paycheck and I'm getting through it. I just, ah, but I don't feel like I'm really in my sweet spot. I'm not even sure why I'm on this earth for when it comes to eternity and spiritual things. Why not start early? Why not, why not take some time in this season as we look at all these and begin to be receptive to how God would lead you? I mean, I think too many of us are out of balance. Not, you know, we've been talking, the church is out of balance, and it is. But I think many of us are out of balance in life, financially, spiritually, relationally. You know you're out of balance, and Fair warning, these are going to hurt, okay? These are going to hurt, or they might just catch your attention. You know you're out of balance when you've made a lot of money, but your kids want nothing to do with God. You know you're out of balance when you've worked hard building your business, but not hard enough at your marriage. You know you're out of balance, and I jotted a few things in the notes on my phone. You know you're out of balance when you let bitterness and resentment remain in your relationships. You know you're out of balance when it takes a tragedy or a funeral for God to finally get your attention. You know you're out of balance when you don't think much about God other than on Sundays. You know you're out of balance when as a believer you still don't take time to pray or read His Word. You know you're out of balance when spiritual things are rarely talked about at home. You know you're out of balance when there's all kinds of issues you've been avoiding to talk with to your spouse or your kids about. You're out of balance. You're out of balance when your friendship with your teenager has become more important than parenting your teenager. You know you're out of balance when you think you can keep hiding your secrets and nobody will ever find out. You're out of balance when you're quick to take care of everybody else 
and neglect to take care of yourself. You're out of balance when you're quick to assess everybody else and neglect to assess yourself. Here's why this is so vitally important is this next verse. Put up on the screen if you would, Karen, for me. This is why this is so important because he makes the whole body fit together perfectly as each person does its own special work, not just one role, each person. It helps the other parts grow so that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. Isn't that what you want for your own life? To grow, to accomplish something, your sweet spot, your spiritual sweet spot, to grow, be healthy. Don't you want that for your kids? Imagine, imagine already as a parent identifying maybe what that gift could be in your children or your, your student or your young adult. And instead of coming against them and trying to get them in what you think they should do, you discover what, what that is God, that gift God, and you begin to develop that and you begin to encourage them. Wow. Why not start now? Don't let another decade slip by. Something have to happen to where then you finally, you know, you stop and you take a look. This is going to be a great series. And I think there is so much of that apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher mindset that needs to be activated in our church. And I believe if we grab hold of that in 2021, that that coracle is going to be blown by the wind of the Spirit and take us to people and ministries and other areas in this community that we're still waiting for them to walk through the door, but instead the Spirit is going to take us to them. Amen? And we're going to be in our sweet spot. Why don't you stand with me today? i got to let you go in prayer. got to get ready for the third service. But I thank you for tuning in online as well. I want to pray with you, and I, I trust that even you watching online, you're, you're, you're getting a sense that God wants so much more for you. But at first, we have to be available. We have to slow down enough to stop and listen. So let's do that right now. God, we just uh, come before you right now, Lord. Man, we got plans today. We got plans this week. We've had a hard time keeping our mind on the sermon because we're thinking about what comes next. Lord, we're all busy. Maybe sometimes too busy to, to keep from mission drift. Thank you for your word that brings us back on target. Thank you for your correction for a church that's out of balance, for people that may be out of balance and who needed this moment today to stop and to begin to look around and say, how can we do this better together? How can we work together better? How can we equip and empower each other better? Father, help us as a church. Help me as a pastor. Lord, we're so grateful to be a part of a big family. And we know there comes a lot of bumps and bruises even in a, in a godly family. Even there's hurt, there's wounds. But help us, Lord, not to hold on to bitterness and resentments. When there is issues between us, God, may we do what your word says and make allowances for each other's faults and to be full of love one towards another. Meet us at our need, point of need right now. Those that are here that are really hurting, struggling with something, God, just pray that your spirit will, will reach them right now. Touch them right now. We know, God, that you'll help us every step of the way as we walk in your peace and walk in your presence. In Jesus' name, everybody said amen, amen. God bless you. Have a great, powerful week. See ya.